let's get started. As I said, I'd like to get you to know each one of these uh, uh, people. And um, what I'd like to do first is um, bring on Andreas from uh, ZF um, in Friedrichshafen. Andreas, uh, uh, yeah, let's have Andreas come up. There we go. Andreas, Hi. thanks for joining. Uh, one word, couple of sentences about uh, Z, uh, Friedrichshafen, if you don't know them. They're known for mobility. As a matter of fact, they're most known for next generation mobility, not just automobiles, but anything that moves, not only on the land, but in the sea, in the air. If it moves, then I guarantee you somewhere behind the scenes that a Friedrichshafen has had something to do with that along the way. They're very big. There's 155,000 employees. They've got 271 locations. So we are talking about um, lots of challenges. And Andreas is joining us as a quality engineer. Andreas, thanks for joining. Okay, thank you. Tell me yeah. a little bit of tell me a little bit about your background. Let the audience know about you, how you got to where you are, and what you're doing at the moment. Okay, good. My background: uh, I'm a mechanical engineer, so not like you, chemical, but mechanical. Um, so uh, started my career in ZF 25 years ago, um, and I was working in development, in production, and now in in quality and yeah, uh, what I had in the last 20 years was always working with new products, interesting products, um, sometimes very challenging products. So challenging in manufacturing always means you have problems the whole day. <laughs> um, you start something, you have existing processes, you have new products and you try to match the products with the existing processes. And um, I think the journey, what we are talking about today started Round about in 2004, when we started our first training for Six Sigma. So I was in the first wave for Six Sigma Greenbelts from ZF. At that time, it was Sachs, but later ZF. Um, and it was a new way of working for mechanical engineer because they were always talking about data, data, data driven, uh, data facts, statistics, and so on. So um, till that time, it was more hands-on working in production. So you try to optimize something very much by trial and error. And now we started to use facts data um, at that time with a low, low amount of data. So in Six Sigma, you always train to calculate the minimum sample size. So you're talking about 25, maybe you want to have 30 and someone says, oh, 30 is too much to get. So uh, let's reduce it to 25. Yeah. Um, so we started, um, you use software for that. You are, you are the king of data. You're really the best of. Um, yeah, and then you learn more and more how much data you have in your production. So you see, oh, we measure something here. We measure something there. Where are the data stored? Oh, it's not stored, or it's stored in a certain way which you cannot use. So the journey starts, and the amount of information you get is getting more and more. And on the journey, you meet a lot of colleagues who are interested in using that. So we had additional Six Sigma waves. We trained people in Six Sigma and so on. And very often, we struggled with using this information. So we try to optimize some machines. We had the informations. Uh, yeah, you know the way how to get the information from an old machine. Yeah, it's called USB stick. There is no network connection. It's just running to the line, um, getting the data on a stick, running back to the office, trying to, to, to use them. Um, it worked. Uh, but in total, you always saw it was a little bit like, how can we do it a bit better? And then we went to these days where we got huge amount of data from our point of view, let's say. Others would say, okay, we produced that in one second. Um, but it was around about, let's say, 200,000 data sets. And you start to struggle. You see that, for example, Excel sometimes at that time was not able to handle this amount. You couldn't open it. Same with other software. And that was where we started to think about new ways of using data and how to handle them. I remember once we had 
thousands of files from one line collected in years and the task was get it together yeah and getting it together was not like uh, push a button or use excel yeah frank is laughing so i think he knows that yeah. uh, so uh, it was like you you're you have a task and you have no idea how to do that uh, we tried it with old dos tools no way and that was the time when we started with with nime at that time uh, we found that it was a software with which we could use yeah and since that time we are more and more using data i wouldn't say in this high level of modeling and deep learning and so on it's more of the daily stuff that you need yeah and yeah you start projects you have people who are interested and finally, you see that a lot of people are handling data the whole day. I would assume, I've seen some other factories too, so I would assume everyone has the same problem or same task. You have people sitting in an office for hours, copying data, um, pasting data into another software, trying to make no failures there and so on. And this is where we started uh, yeah, our journey from statistics, from low level data or low amount of data to bigger amount of data and starting to automize it to say it's a digitalization. And the nice part, which was really interesting and is still interesting for all the colleagues, I think, uh, we can use the knowledge of our colleagues. It's not like writing a requirement book for any um, nerd who will use Python to write something or anything else. We are using our experts from our factory. We train them that they can do it by themselves. They get some support if they need it. And yeah, finally, we end up with um, less work, less failures. Uh, so we had projects, for example, where people were sitting for hours just to copy the data of the last production day. And now it's one click. It's just one click. And they can do some more interesting stuff than just copying data. Yeah. And that's okay. Thanks for, the, thanks for the intro, because I think that gives everybody a perspective that you, you're, you're suffering or you have had the same challenges. And I'm sure everybody out there can can identify with those challenges. So we're gonna come back and ask you some questions about your experiences. Yep. And I think that's where it's gonna be, be interesting. In the meantime, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna bring on our second person here, and, and that's Danielle. Danielle, you get to, you get to come up now. Um, Danielle is with the Fraunhofer Institute. Now, for those of you that don't know the Fraunhofer Institute, it's famous worldwide because there's plenty of institutions that do theoretical things but Fraunhofer is famous for applied science. In other words, they take new topics, they take new science, and they figure out how to make it practical and useful. There are 75 of these institutes, all specializing on different topics. And Danielle is working in the Fraunhofer Institute for Building Physics and also has a very interesting journey. So Danielle, please tell us a little bit about yourself and what you're doing. Yeah, th thank you, Phil, for this nice in introduction. Very happy to be here with all of you. Um, as you already pointed out very well, like the nice part of working at Fraunhofer is like operating exactly at this spot between more basic research and its implementation in industry practice. And I, for myself, um, as head of the business field, my work um, and the work of my team is all about helping industry to build capacity for efficient sustainability analytics. That means um, software and data, but also the skills, for example, to uh, analyze carbon footprints of the various different products in, in large product portfolios. And a very, very common challenge in that is that you have to uh, use a lot of data from many different sources that were never made to be integrated but you have to integrate it and analyze it efficiently and naturally um, data science tools and methods can come in very handy in this part and help to reach the efficiency to actually scale such analysis on a whole portfolio level so um, in our daily work i think i can relate to many of the things uh, 
Andreas just mentioned, and that's also what we still see in our daily lives. And not too long back, um, it was also how we operated ourselves with a lot of uh, um, manual copy pasting and uh, not uh, using not so efficient tools. Okay, now you and I are both chemical engineers, so um, we're, we're going to point out here to all the mechanical engineers out there that what's interesting about any time you work with data, we think of it as a process, we think of it as a flow, you can think of it as a data flow, and that's exactly what we're talking about. Interestingly enough, that's why it's so fun to talk to manufacturing about the science of data, data science, if you will, uh, because it is always about this process, this flow of data that you're converting into something new. What I like about uh, what Danielle's doing is, it's actually taking a new topic, but it's also taking data sources and manipulating them in new ways. I mean, I just recently did this for NIME as well, where you had to go through and figure out and say, what is our carbon footprint? Where is it coming from? And how do we do something about it? Um, and so I can appreciate uh, your research and your work on that, because although it's a new topic, the things we have to do are exactly the same, the challenges we have. So thank you very much, Danielle. I appreciate you being there. And um, what we're now going to do is we're going to go to Frank, who comes from a little tiny company that I'm sure nobody's ever heard of um, <laughs> called Bosch. <laughs> I always have to start that way. I'm a huge, I mean, Bosch is so big. Frank, pull yourself up on the screen here. We're gonna get Frank up. Bosch is so big. Um, but of course, as a do-it-yourselfer, I didn't tell you this in advance, um, Bosch does so many things, but it also makes the coolest professional tools for, for people that work at home. I have so many of your, your tools, it's amazing. But just to put this in perspective, I actually wrote down some statistics. Bosch currently has, Bosch has 401,000 employees, 440 subsidiaries, um, and I love your new tagline, like a Bosch. So obviously, being such a small, tight organization, you have no data problems whatsoever, right, Frank? <laughs> it would be great to have these. <laughs> Tell us a little nice bit about yourself and, and what you've run into and what you've experienced. So about myself, I'm uh, the only non-engineer here. I'm uh, basically, uh, uh, there is literally no proper uh, explanation in English. I'm an electronic specialist with focus on uh, radio technology. Oh. It's, uh, even in German, it's a horrifyingly long word uh, that describes it, and there is no, no explanation, uh, translation in English. I am uh, work for Bosch since more than 30 years now. I started uh, literally working on a shop floor on sitting on a machine doing uh, uh, work on, on, on and producing stuff and producing goods. Um, uh, did some kind of career there. Uh, then after six years or so, I was in an internal department where we built special machinery, production machines for Bosch. Um, for 15 years or something like this, 16 years. Um, then I uh, was in a central IT department of a business unit with the focus on uh, IT and manufacturing, as we call it. So basically the, uh, these, the IT security around machines on a shop floor, because even back in that days, everything was connected. They reside in a, in a network and you have to keep them somewhat safe because you want them to produce and not any virus should shut down your, uh, uh, your manufacturing. Um, then I switched in my actual department about four years ago. And there we do uh, data analytics on manufacturing data. We train colleagues to use NIME, Tableau, everything to go through these haystacks of of data the MES systems collected over the last 10, 15, 20 years. Um, I am part of a data mining working group of the business unit where we uh, tackle explicit problems of, of plants around the world. So when, when a plant have a, a, a problem they cannot solve, they can ask us. So we did some kind of hackathons uh, to solve their problems. 
uh, we realize new data connections and 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 data setups for new products so we deal a lot with mes data and with really huge amount of data sets what i mean when i say huge amounts <laughs> dozens of billions of data sets in humongously large tables that's I, I, I love mean. a quote you do in your video which i'll refer to at the end where you say you get more data what's the quote you compare yourself to uh, quantities of data to how much twitter data comes yeah. in the world every day yeah. what's what's the comparison there the uh, twitter do around 500 to 600 million messages a day our backend and it's a centralized backend so 250 plus plants every machine fires messages to that backend and this backend do about 1.5 billion messages a day so, so when people say there's a new concept called big data you just laugh yeah <laughs> i mean it's it, <laughs> the the guys of the mes systems they do this since 10 15 years 20 years sometimes in depending yeah. on the company and and they deal with big data even before the term was invented exactly that, I think the trick is key. now, what can you, what, what are we doing with it differently? And that's what's going to bring us on to our topic. So thank you very much. Um, I'm going to move on and bring all four of us back and the first slide, because we've got the first topic. Um, somebody in our marketing team said that, you know, there's so many people talking about this concept of resilient manufacturing. And they said, I bet if you've got experts, they're going to be able to talk about that. Uh, for everybody in the out in the uh, that's watching this, what is resilient manufacturing? Here's one definition: the ability to manufacture a constant quality at reasonable cost and production times, despite disturbances and uncertainties. And when you go in and look at this, you see that there's lots and lots and lots of topics that can have volatility. And they're saying, you know, now we have a need for agility, speed, and control. I have to ask each of you: Is this new? Andreas? No. I think nothing changed in production. It was always the same. The only thing that changes is the speed at the moment. It's getting faster. Yeah. But the rest, it's the same like 20 years ago. Yeah. Frank, what do Just you think? Just the numbers go bigger. That's 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 the thing. I mean, when Bosch produces parts for car makers and they sell millions of cars, so the best thing to think about it when you have a car maker and that car maker produces 1 million cars count the amount of spark plugs in yeah. that 1 million cars so we have plants outputting 13 to 50 80 million products a year and now you want to keep the unique identifier the manufacturing date the patches, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. Um, and resilient manufacturing, as it's quoted here, means you have to keep your manufacturing up and running. Yeah. It must be safe. It must be secure. It must produce. You need a lot of domain knowledge to do this. Not only in data. It's it's, it's yeah. Power it's supply, water. <laughs> I, I think when I when I when I talk to you guys, what I'm hearing is, look, we've always had to do resilient manufacturing, and sometimes the topics change. Um, so, Danielle, that's that's like with you with with your topic of sustainability. That's a fairly new topic, and it's changing quickly. But it's but the approach is going to be the exact same thing in terms of what you have to do to get an answer. Would you agree with that mm -hmm. or disagree? Yeah, that, the approach is there for a very long time. Like um, many companies started 20, 30 years back to do the first life cycle assessment. But um, also, as Frank just mentioned, uh, the, the amount of assessments and analysis you need to do today is much, much bigger than, than in, in the past. And taking the corporate sustainability perspective, it's very safe to say we recently see a massive increase in requests for sustainability related information from various different stakeholders 
from investors, from clients, but also from all the different business units uh, uh, which engage in finding solutions for reducing the carbon footprint or other uh, sustainability metrics. So I, I think, yeah, there uh, most certainly is a demand for increased efficiency and uh, capacity to flexibly handle all these different uh, Re requests and uh, for support with regard to sustainability related topics. And I think for all of us, what we can say is um, the process may not have changed, but the tools and the ways that we have have changed so that we can hopefully respond a little quicker, do things a little bit faster. And that actually brings me up to my next topic. Um, we want to talk about common themes for success. And I did a little pre briefing. Uh, no, you know, nobody scripted, but we came up with two or three topics that we all agree are actually incredibly important when it comes to being successful with uh, a data practice, a data science practice. And what I'd like to do is go through each one of those. It's going to be just an open question thing. But up until now, um, all of you who are on the webinar know that you're, you know, you're, you're, you're in. Uh, a NIME webinar, and uh, all three of our guests have mentioned NIME, but they haven't actually talked about what it is. So to save time, everybody uh, volunteered me to give you just a two-minute summary of what is NIME, what are we talking about here, as we talk about best practices and, and all of the other topics. Um, this will just be very, very short. For those of you that know absolutely nothing about NIME or have not done projects like this before, Let's face it, what we all want to do is we all want to have a result at the end of the day. We're going to take data and we're going to do something with it. Now, whether that be from uh, an Excel spreadsheet or a USB stick, as Andrea said, where we run around and try to capture the data and, and, and get what we need in the beginning, we're going to take that data and try to create something. There's a process involved behind that. And NIME's approach is that we're going to provide a software ecosystem to make sure that you can create anything you want to create. But that's not enough. You can't just create something. It's not just a report. A lot of times, particularly in manufacturing, you have to be able to get that information in the right form, used correctly within the organization, whether that be back on the plant floor, whether that be back in some sort of other operational system. If it's not used, it's useless. That's the high level approach. For those of you that um, are been doing this for a while, you realize that you have to be able to go out and get the data, manipulate it, there are certain things you do to it, you optimize it, you create some sort of result specific to your um, problem. Then when it comes to productionizing, particularly in really large organizations like uh, ZF and, and Bosch, and maybe some of you out there in the rest of the world, you have to go this through this process of making sure you can operationalize it. And there's some topics there. We won't go into the details there, but NIME's approach is to provide a software system to do that. We don't do this with 150 products. There's two products and one ecosystem. The first one is on the left. It's called the NIME Analytics Platform. It's for the individual. It gives you all the capabilities you need for data science uh, creation. In other words, creating things. And as Andrea said, you, it, this is not just about machine learning. It's about all the things you have to do to gather, transform, and get it in the right form. That package is open source and it is free. There's no limits to it. On the production side, that's the NIME server. It complements and it provides capabilities for collaboration, security, um, automation, APIs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You may not need that in your organization, but that's there. That is NIME. So when any of the four of us refer to NIME, that's what we're talking about. Was that a good two minute uh, advertisement, guys? Does that <laughs> summarize it pretty well? I, what I wanted to do was, um, there's gonna be something we're gonna talk about in a minute about uh, groups of people and getting them up to speed. Something different about NIME is it's visual programming. Um, instead of learning to code, instead of learning to some sort of syntax, what you learn is that these blocks are called nodes. Behind each node is a capability. You configure it very easy in a little window, and to do something, you hook it together. For the chemical engineers among us, it's just a flow. It's a data flow. It's a pipeline. And I think even the um, everybody else can understand the fact that this is a very easy concept to learn and get up to speed. Why is this so important? This is important because everything in NIME actually has that. 
it doesn't matter what you have for data sources. Uh, Andreas was talking about data sources. Um, we were all talking about the variety of data sources. We have to make it easy for you to use nodes to get to those data sources. We have to make it easy for you to do data transformations and maybe some of the specialized things. We have to make it easy for you to use the specialized when you get that far machine learning. You shouldn't have to go off and learn some other language. You should be able to do it all through this simple visual programming. We have to make it easy for you to get out there and do it on a particular platform. You have to be able to use what you know already. Maybe some of you are scripters. You need to be able to use that within this platform. And last but not least, you want to make sure it ends up in the tool that you know best for visualization, whether it be Excel or Tableau or one of the others. Okay, that's it for the product pitch on Nime. But when we refer to the, our topics for team success, all of us are going to refer to Nime. And now for those of you that don't know Nime, that's what it is. Finito. <laughs> the first topic I want to talk about, because all of us brought it up, is building competence. Um, so do we go out and buy uh, hire hundreds of engineers, data engineers, data science people? What do we do? Who wants to start? Because each one of you have an opinion on building competence. Frank, you start since you started last. You were last last time. You could be first this time. <laughs> um, in my opinion, when building competence takes time, so you always need a consistency in in the heads and in the people. And best example, the the data mining working group I am in, the core of let's say six to eight people are the same since four years okay so they saw a lot of things they solved a lot of things they did not solve a lot of things but they learned during that amount of time and all across that that many problems they faced and building that takes time it's, it's, so it's, is it just those people and everybody else makes requests? Uh, I know that's not the case. No, you need, I always say you need the main competence. It's like we talked earlier in resilient manufacturing. You need the main knowledge and the main competence. And you have to identify that. It's, it can be the guy on the machine working then since seven, eight years on the very same machine doing all the day all the same stuff the engineer that analyzes or solves problems since a couple of years the the it guy that is on that shop floor for many years it's it's so many different domains and you need that knowledge and you have to combine it and 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 get your your yeah your head around it basically and make them understand each other because all of them live in their own bubble they speak their own language and you need a very good translator in between those they can understand each other and so, that you have um, to andreas so can, can you actually enable a lot of these non-specialists with this sort of tool like nime uh, what's your experience there that's that's the main point for it first of all um building competence is just one part for me for me, it's more, I love the, the word demystifying something. So anal, analyzing data, if you talk to people and you say you're your data analyst or whatever, they would say, wow, stop. Uh, I don't want to, want to hear anything about that because that stuff I would never understand. So I think building competency is reducing the fear of it. So bringing people into the boat. And as uh, Frank mentioned, um, we have experts, but the risk is we lose the experts because they are not part of the game. And so, yes, um, I fully agree to Frank and additional, we reach a lot of people, much more than you would ever expect because it starts from the bottom. So my, my way of working here is try to infect as much people as possible. It's not a critical virus here. It's a good virus. Yeah, so um, we infect people. So no one is outside. Uh, everyone is part of it. No, not everyone will understand this high-level model building and all the, the, the stuff there. 
but we start from the bottom, train as much people as possible so they know what's going on. And then they will support you. Daniel, what's your experience yeah. working with non-specialists in all of yeah. this? <laughs> yeah, I can I can very much relate with uh, what both Frank and uh, Andrea said before. Also, when looking back at my own personal journey, like I, well, I'm an engineer, so I wasn't wasn't an uh, expert in data engineering or data science. Like 10, 12 years back, I got started with it, and I think it was one of the best professional decisions in in my life at that time i worked as a sustainability uh, researcher and we worked on uh, the life cycle assessment of airplanes so fairly large products and we had to work with a lot a lot of data and our means at that time were very slow and it was also when actually big data this this term got hyped and i was just curious uh, what, what's behind it and um, look for some tools and, and methods people were using in this field and very quickly I figured out hey there's actually some stuff which is not too difficult to learn and I can really apply in my in my daily work and it all uh, started from that so um, I, I think like even if I look at how, how things are today it's even much easier to learn today than it was like 10, 10 years back. There's so much great material and tools um, out there to get started with. And I think uh, what Andrea said, it's really an important point to de demystify it and don't make the data science stuff look like magic because it, it's not. And there are many, many things you can get started with uh, quickly and build from that. Is this is this concept we have at NIME of visual programming? Is that just marketing, blah blah, or does that help? <laughs> Be honest, Frank. <laughs> to me, the th second most important invention in the last century was the graphical user interface. That's my personal opinion, and why? Because it enables literally everyone and anybody to use some kind of technology. And that's, to me, the key of NIME, because it uses a graphical interface. We humans are visual animals, that's for sure. And I, I prefer to dig into a NIME workflow containing 350 nodes than demystified 20 lines of python it is it, it makes more fun and it's 10,000 times faster yeah. andreas what's yeah. your experience there yeah. i have a question why do uh, children love to play lego yeah. because <laughs> it's easy and you can create something very fast by yourself and it looks good so playing Lego is one one way to do something. Maybe it's not always professional, but everyone can do it after a very short time. And a craftsman can build nice things, yeah. But they need special machines, special knowledge, yeah. No, no one would start this this journey if it's too complex. And writing code, in my opinion, is not demystifying it, yeah. So I, I love this graphical way, and this is where people learn very fast. In, in nine, we have people after two hours, they can use it. That's two hours to digitalize workflows. Yeah, that's incredible. I have an experience myself mm -hmm. with a university who trains in data engineering and all these methods. And the professor said to me recently, you know, it used to take me the whole first year for them to learn the syntax of a programming language before they could actually start doing anything. And now at nine, they can do it in one morning. Uh, and then we're off to learning what to do, not how to do it, which I, I think is a kind of a good way of summarizing it. Um, that seems to be a common theme that we, we you know, we, we've got our specialists, the specialists need access to all of those tools, all of the really special tools they want. But at the same time, we've got this huge group of people who just wants to do something else. Um, and that kind of brings me back to my second topic, and I will uh, 
Um, ah, before I do that, people people uh, wanted to ask me something about sharing experience. Um, one of the things that's nice about NIME, you've seen the concept of a workflow, is that you can actually package it up. And I think Andrea said it becomes visual. You or Frank, one of you said it's 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 so easy to take a look at it and learn quickly without having to go through the detailed code. I think that was Frank. And what we've got out there for you is a lot of these are manufacturing examples. There are actually um, some called the NIME Hub. There's over 6,000 examples, working examples. You can take a look at some of them and just sort of get a feel for it. And of course, there's also a form out there to kind of help you with this journey of how do I start? What type people might be interested in it? What sort of things I could do? And I think that kind of helps with the building competence, this ability to capture something and share it very, very quickly. I'm going to go on to our second topic here. Um, and this goes into, we, we've talked about different groups, and it's probably people along some sort of a line. You've got your specialists, and you've got um, maybe your domain experts learning all of this. Do they stay in silos, or do they start trying to work together? I'd like your, your experience trying to get people working together, because, of course, that's a very important thing. Um, Andreas, do you want to start? Yeah, I think... Um... The nice thing it's it's again this visual part. I think if you're writing code, you're you may be a nerd. So you sit in front of your monitor, you write your code, everything is fine. And as it's very easy to explain what you do there, it's easy to communicate with others to say, okay, this is what my workflow is doing, and what what I observe is that people talk about what they created there. It's not only showing the result. They want to show how they did it. They talk uh, about new ways of working, using variables or whatever inside to say, wow, well, I found a new way to do it. And that's one part of using NIME. And on the other side, sharing information is helping this resilient uh, manufacturing in the end. There. Yep. So if you talk about it, you say, I found something. Let's have a look at, at, at a graph or whatever. Um, people will say, okay, it's helping us. Yeah, they see it. Um, and, um, Daniel, anything to add? Yeah, I, I, I think the cross team, like I'm looking at from the perspective of corporate sustainability, and I uh, usually work with uh, sustainability managers and analysts. And uh, for their work, most certainly cross-team interaction is extremely important and a major success factor for any sustainability pro uh, project. Even though, sure, um, sustainability, sustainability analysts are highly educated people, they're usually engineers or sci scientists from, from a background, and um, it's kind of easy to pick up some data science skills and get much more e efficient in, in your work. But in the end, the decisions to reduce uh, carbon emissions, for example, they're made in other places, in these various uh, business units, um, throughout your company, but also at your clients with using your products in, in, in the right way, or even attracting in investors in uh, like uh, with, with uh, great ideas for uh, new products or way of producing things. So in, in the end, it is uh, um, it is major importance to closely collaborate with, with them and make sure you use the right tools in order to make uh, this collaboration as efficient as possible. Yeah. Frank, any thoughts? You're in a team that's central, but you also support a lot of people around and about. Is it just train them and let them go on their own or what's the interaction? The, the thing is, if you can't break up the silos, they start to fight against against each other. And then you are on the losing side because then you you burn energy in a in a way that that won't bring you any further. And sometimes you just turn around and the silos broke down and everything is fine. And on the other side, sometimes it took you hours and days and weeks to to tear down these walls. It's it's yeah, but you have to establish a good cross team interaction that's that's key 
you need them <laughs> every uh, single one <laughs> Yeah, one of the things at Nime is we've we've noticed that, and and although a lot of these have to do with people issues, uh, getting people together, getting them to talk, you know, uh, getting them to understand they have some commonality. By the way, the the whole concept of a, a a flow through data actually helps there to get different departments. We've got a couple of things behind the scenes that we've tried to do to make this a little bit easier. Um, on the NIME side, when people are going about building these little workflows, you can actually package them in such a way that they look just like a node. Now that sounds really silly, but it's incredibly powerful because it means specialist in Frank's team or Daniel's team um, uh, or in Andreas's team. They can build things and package them in a quite sophisticated way and give them to people who are possibly not able to build it themselves, they could definitely use it themselves. Um, and there's some capabilities in there to make this so that it looks just like any other node in NIME. And as all of you are always all now all experts in NIME, you know it's just click, track, drop, and hook them together. It means you can do some quite sophisticated thing. What we're trying to do is we're trying to make it easy for the database specialists to do their thing and make it available to others so that they can use it. The data engineer, uh, the coding specialist, the data scientist who has a speciality, trying to make it easy for them to package their expertise and make it available to those who could use the expertise, but just need a way of actually interacting with it. And of course, um, I think what all three of you mentioned is at the end of the day, you have to have it in the right form so that you can actually communicate it and share it and and uh, talk about it with other groups. So that's just a couple of things we're doing there to try to make it from a technology side. I'm gonna stop on that topic just because I think everybody's got the idea that it's important and there's some core things we've got to do to get people working together. The last topic for me that we're gonna talk about today is resource flexibility. Um, what does resource flexibility mean to you? We'll start with Danielle, we'll start with you. Like um, in the beginning, I already mentioned uh, like, uh, for sustainability experts, they, they're really faced with a lot, lot, lot of different requests and they need to be very flexible to answer them. So on the one hand side, it's the human resource that needs to be flexible. And to answer these various different questions, you always need um, a, a different way how you uh, analyze and prepare the information to communi communicate to the perspective role. So you also need to be very flexible with what kind of information resources you tap in, in which way. And uh, like data science tools can help a lot in uh, doing this with the necessary efficiency. Okay, Frank, I know you've got a, a different definition or an extended <laughs> definition of what's a resource. Talk about it a little bit. <laughs> Um, when we talk about human resources, we see actually um, more and more people get deeper and deeper into certain programming languages, Python, Shiny, R, C, whatever, and they can use NIME in a very flexible way because whatever they can tackle in their desired language, they can do it and they can and, and NIME is flexible enough to use it as a resource, so to say. And what they cannot tackle in their desired language, they simply do in NIME. Resources, in, speak, in, in terms of data, we found nothing NIME could not read. <laughs> it's it's, it's okay. flexible and versatile, yeah. Yeah. Andreas, what do you have to add, add, add there in terms of resources? Can't hear you. Yeah. Can't hear Andreas. We've lost Andreas's volume. Let's see. There now I'm go. back. Now I'm back. Sorry. Um, for, for me, resource is equal to speed. Okay. Uh, if you always have or need a third party to do something, you need an offer, you need budget, you need a, a, a communication. You have, to, you have to explain it to someone who has zero knowledge about what you're doing there. So um, we can use our human resources much better when they do it by themselves. If it's not too big, okay, there, there is a certain borderline to say, okay, now we need an expert. But 
I would say for, for if we take Pareto again and say it's 80-20, maybe 80% of this daily business can be done by ourselves. It's much faster and we are um, leading it. So if we need to change something, it's not like asking for a new offer and waiting for months until you get a slot to do it. You just tell someone, do it, and tomorrow it's done. And that's, for me, what's the most important part here. It's speed. Yeah, I, I, that's one of the things I like about this. We talk about, um, we talk a lot about, and I'm about upskilling. So you get going on something, you get a new challenge, you learn how to take what you just did, modify it quickly for the next project, you get a totally different project. Once again, you understand the concepts, you can go in and keep adding to that, and you can kind of cycle through, ramp yourself up in terms of the different uh, problems you're tackling with it quite quickly. And that's, that's, a, that's a good summary with the speed. Um, Frank, anything else to add on this one? And as always, when you when you look after some month, years after a steep learning curve in nine, and you look at your first workflows, they look awful. They are not very performant by any means. They are just ugly. Um, but they worked. But yeah, that's the that's the point. They they worked, and and obviously, and in a, in a certain point. Uh, a Python or C monolith will be more powerful, will be faster, whatever. Uh, but until that, it's hard to beat nine, in my in my opinion. Yeah, and it's it's it it it, it will be long way enough. <laughs> yeah. Let, um, let me just add one thing that we haven't talked about here when we talk about resources. Nobody's mentioned IT. It used to be one of those challenges that, oh my God, we need a bigger machine. We need more of this. We need a... To be honest, I don't think that's the, that's the limiting factor. I think it's people, it's processes, it's, it's the speed with which we can tackle it. One of the reasons is behind the scenes, NIME, it works on Windows, it works on Macs, it works on Linux, it works locally, it works in the cloud. It's that same two ecosystem thing I showed you before where you can mix and match it. So the old thing about, oh, we have to work on this kind of machine or we're not going to be able to do it. We've just kind of removed that from the equation. So at least in terms of IT resource flexibility, um, you've got a lot of choices there. So you can concentrate on the real things. Uh, I, I'm old enough to remember that IT used to be my favorite excuse for not getting the team to work together. I knew it was going to be a trouble, but I, I knew that it was going to take me six months to get the hardware. So whew, I was out of that problem and I could blame it on the hardware. Well, anymore, we can't blame it on the IT, at least uh, the resources, because the flexibility is there. I had to show that to people because that always comes up as a question. Oh, it must be about the IT resources. No, I think it's really interesting what you guys said. It's all about the people. It's about the working together. It's about getting up to, sp it's, it's, it's about speed. I guess that's really the definition of resilience. Um, I'm not going to pick up any more topics for team success. Um, we, I, I, I noted a lot of other ones that we could talk about, and there's some resources we're going to refer people to, but I do want to make sure we have time for a, a couple of questions. So for anybody watching, if there's other topics here, I'll be giving you some information later to get you some more details on maybe one of these other topics is important to you when it comes to uh, team success. But in the meantime, I'm going to move straight on to the Q&A. And uh, uh, and uh, I know there's a couple of questions. Um, let me see. Well, let's let's see what the first question is. Um, I know there was a question about Python. Can we pop up the Python question? Because that was a, what about Python? Boy, is that a loaded question. <laughs> uh, opinions, Frank. What do you think? I always say we need to get rid of that tool discussion. I do not care if you solve a problem in Python, in NIME, in C, in, in, in uh, whatever. Choose, pick your tool, do it wisely, and do your best. And you can integrate it into NIME very likely, very yeah. easily. So, so you're saying use your tool of choice, use your preferred approach, but use, use NIME to help pull it all together and make sure it can be shared and, and reused and things. Andreas, mm. got an opinion? Yeah, for me, we shouldn't build silos based on tools or languages. Yeah, 
The target is we want to solve problems. We want to have a running production. If anyone is specialist in Python, we should use it. Why not? Yeah. <laughs> um, so it's not like we kill Python or R or anything else in the world. No, we are trying to make the best out of all of it. And in the end, we, we need a solution. Doesn't matter how we do it. Yeah, I like the philosophy of Michael Berthold, who's the CEO at NIME. He says, look, we're going to, you know, we can't be the experts at absolutely everything on the planet. There's too many other things out there open source where, you know, there's, there's teams of thousands of people out there, you know, Python, R, all of this stuff. What we've got to do is we've got to make sure that we can get to all of that, make sure it's included, that it's available to you within NIME so that NIME becomes... Um, maybe you do everything nine, but nine may become your orchestrator so that you pull things in. Uh, Daniel, what's your experience with that? Yeah, I, I also think it's all about choosing the right tool um, for, the, for the right job and the right person at the right time. And sometimes also for us, we, we use Python. There are some people who like R and uh, the important part is that the work of the different people uh, can work work together, and uh, that you can bring it into an environment that is that can be easily deployed by people who don't know how to code. And uh, like platforms similar to Nime, uh, they really help a lot in making this knowledge and know-how um, within the code accessible to to all the other people who can make use of it. Thanks. I've got a question specifically for Frank, but I think others can join in. Um, Frank, somebody's asking here in the chat, how broadly distributed is the knowledge about data processes in your company? True. <laughs> you know um, all your colleagues, I guess. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, I know a lot. <laughs> but um, well, That's not really a trick question. It's, I think yeah. it's kind of an interesting one from a... Well, what's your, what's your experience to date? Feuerbach plant exists since more than 100 years. And we do high volume production and manufacturing since most of that time. So we have a lot of engineers and guys doing data analytics and problem solving since decades, literally sometimes since decades. And they have a gut feeling and they have already their tool stack which not fits into modern worlds like XGBoost, et cetera, PP. But in the, in the end of the day, they solved their problems and they did it good because I'm sitting here, Bosch still exists. So they did an awesome and plain awesome job and they use it with the tools they get on hand. So, and we have to transform that into the modern world so that we do not lose that knowledge. And it's hard to identify. We have more than 10,000 people working at Feuerbach, so it's not easy. It's not like standing the canteen and say, yeah, here I am, come to it. No, that won't work. <laughs> but it's, I, to my understanding, it, and it's broadly spread, yeah. really broadly spread. Andreas, you got an opinion there? First of all, I fully agree. And the, the big question is, as, as Frank tried, tried to explain, what is the uh, the definition of knowledge about data processes? What yeah. are data processes? Yeah. So copy, copying data from a USB stick 10 years ago was a data process. Yeah. And today we have data processes. We think it's much better. And in 10 years, maybe they will laugh about our processes. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, I think it is distributed. Yeah. But it's, again, take the people to the journey. Yeah. To I move forward. Yeah, move forward. Um, I'm going to go and, and, and sort of go to my final slide here. If we'll go back to, 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 to the slides as well, because we're going to run out of time. Otherwise, we will get everybody's questions answered officially. I'm sure we scene. can talk for days. <laughs> we, yeah, exactly, we can. But what I want from each of you is some sort of a concluding statement. You know, one should always end up with something, you know, as Jean-Luc Picard said on Star Trek, boldly go where no one has gone before. But I'll, I'll save that. What final thought do you want to leave people when it comes to the journey for data science, for data processes, for moving things forward? Um, Andreas, you want to start? Yeah, I would try to keep it short. 
just try it. Don't be afraid of it. Yeah. Just try it. Sounds like just, a good slogan. Just do it. Yeah. yeah. Just do Daniel, it. Yeah. That's... Daniel, what about you? Yeah, um, I f fully agree. And also mentioned, I think for me as an engineer, it was one of the best decisions to have a look at what data science has, has to offer. And if you get started, no or low code tools are most certainly a very good uh, starting point. They're easy to learn. And also, if you don't use them like on an everyday basis, and I know a lot, a lot of people I work with, they don't get to use it on an everyday basis. It's much more easy to remember how to build a, a workflow in, in a uh, no code tool and to remember the code you have to type uh, in, in the programming language. And yeah, it's even, a, even, a very even big uh, benefit. Yeah, even the macro in the Excel, sometimes I can never remember how to do it. So, Frank, what about you? Final words. Just do it and don't hesitate to ask the guys with your domain knowledge. Yeah, that's excellent. That's, Thank you. That's it. Gonna, gonna go back to the slides one last time to do some, some summary here. Um, if you want to learn more on your button over on the left of the, 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 the application you guys are viewing this on, there's a button where you can go to a full manufacturing page. There's so many different topics that we could be talking about. That gives you a link to a lot more. Um, for any of you that want to go into a specialized topic, there is something coming up on the Fourier Transform that might be interesting for certain uh, aspects of manufacturing. You can find, get a little more practical use of NIME in some of those areas. And last but not least is a promise from myself. Um, as you can tell, all three of my guests can talk for hours about this. I mean, they're, they've got so many tips and tricks. Each one of them has actually produced something. In the, case of, in the case of Daniel and Frank, we've got full blog articles. And in the case of Andreas, you can see, you can hear him speaking uh, German, but with, uh, with uh, English uh, subtitles. And what you're going to do is within the hour, you're going to get an email from me with more information about our three guests, because that I think is going to be the most helpful for you just to hear a little bit more about their thinking and, and uh, how they approach things. Um, for all of you that have stayed with us, you will get the slides. You will also get a, a link to the recording. That usually takes about a day to get all of that packaged up. So just after that, but from my side, I think it's about time to um, wrap up. I'd like to give a huge thank you, not just from myself and from Nine, but from all of the attendees who listen to Andreas, Danielle, and Frank. Guys, thank you very much. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye, guys. Care, everybody. Bye. Have a nice evening. <laughs>